Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. You know, it was six years ago in June that I made my first machining video for this channel. And it was in response to a threading video that I watched and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I had to walk out there and uh, introduce many of you to the inverted left to right threading. It's the way I do it. It's the way I've always done it. And as far as threads are concerned, if you're a follower of this channel, you know I'm pretty passionate about doing it right. Well, doing it right has many variables, and I'm going to cover a couple of them. These are probably things you really never thought about, so please hang in there. This is not about thread profile and how to set the compound up and tool height and many of the things that are, are probably basic, but a little bit deeper into actually what's going on when that tool runs a path on the material. Let's assume that there is no material in the lathe. There's a concept for you. And as the tool traverses, it deposits material instead of removing it. Okay? That'd be kind of cool, like a 3D printer, but moving. The final product would be a coil spring. That's exactly what a thread would look like if it was a negative or a positive or a reverse of, of a standard thread. Very much like a Healy coil, that's what you're going to come up with. Well, that Healy coil or that spiral. Spiral staircase has a center line. Believe it or not, it has a center line. The material has a center line. The machine has a center line. All of these things need to be going down between the same two points in space for that thread to work out. If the material is bent, if it's under too much pressure, if there's an inconsistency in the helix to the material to the stock, then the final product, although it may measure correctly when you put the wires to it, I would highly doubt, highly doubt, I mean, I'm not a bet man, but I'd be willing to bet that that thread is not going to engage the maiden part. And you're going to check it, you're going to mic the OD, you're going to check the pitch diameter, everything's going to be perfect, and you're going to go, I don't know what happened. Well, what happened is the relationship between the helix and the stock. And the very easiest way to determine whether or not you're going to have a successful outcome, two ways to do it. Take the piece of material that you're working with and roll it across the surface plate before you start. Don't assume that it's straight, especially if it's towards the end of the bar. If you've got a new fresh 12-foot bar, 10-foot bar, whatever, and you lop off a foot and you think you're going to run an Acme thread on it because, well, it's steel, it's got to be straight. You've got another thing coming because that's not how it works. Material is historically, in my opinion, in my experience, straighter the closer you get to the center of the material, the center of the bar. Don't know why that is. I guess the impact from going through the rollers. Roll it on a surface plate and check it. If it's not straight, if you can't get it straight, then take a dust pass and bring it down to the diameter that you want. Running a thread on a bent piece of material is not going to end well. It might look like a normal thread, but threads only have a couple of thousands worth of interference when it comes time to engage the mating part. If you have an eccentricity between the helix and the OD of the material, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. The easiest way to determine that, and I'm going to do it real quick, real hopefully you're going to be able to see it. And draw it big so you can see it. Here's the end in your tailstock. And here's the end in your 5C column. When you bring your threading tool in and you make initial contact with this part, very light, superficial contact, just enough to scratch it so you can see where you're at, you're going to track a nice ring, continuous ring. All is well. You move this tool to the end, you do the same thing on the end, you're going to get a nice scratch on this end too. Good. You think your material is straight. You have support here, you have rigidity here, of course you're going to have what you believe to be a straight part. Well, that's not true. Take that scratch pass as superficial as you can, now just barely touch the material, engage that half nut and run that first pass. If this line starts to deteriorate or goes intermittent on you, like it could start big, taper down to very little contact, stay there for a bit, and then start coming back up.
material is telling you that it's moving away here. It might be small on one side, big on the other side. You have to look for consistency. It's got to be consistent. If this is doing this, that is telling you, hold the music, stop the music. This is no good. That is absolutely no good. It's never going to end well. Let's say you run that through all the way to completion, and you have a thread. When you check that thread, pitch diameter is there, stock diameter is there, all is well. Okay? What next? Well, what next is you look for the thread profile on here from side to side. If one side of this thread has a nice flat on the crest of the thread and the other side is sharp, well, you're going to know that this side cut more than that side because the deeper you go, the sharper it gets. What does this also tell you? This tells you that the material center line is not collinear with the helix. It's not. There's your error right there. If you see that intermittent scratch pass result, you've got a bad thread. Throw it away. It's not going to work. How do you get away from that? If you have a bent part and that's all the material you have, well, use a steady rest. Excuse me, a follow rest. I always get them too crossed up with terminology. Follow rest moves along with the carriage. That is absolutely filthy, huh? A follow rest moves along with the carriage. Sometimes follow rests can take up more carriage movement than you like. Well, there's two ways to get around that. Take your tool post, unloosen the nut on the tool post, move the tool post as far to the left as you possibly can on your compound, turn your compound, and crank your compound in to make up for any extra space that you may need. This may or may not work, but I know that uh, if you need options, that is certainly a good option. As far as that follow rest is concerned, it is vital that the follow rest doesn't jump around. The follow rest moves. <sighs> Why bother? Because the material is influencing the follow rest, you're still going to end up with that off-center thread. How do you know if the thread is off-center? Well, you put your three wires on and you mic it and you got your pitch diameter. Lose two of them wires. Put the other two on the bench. Use one wire. Measure it. Turn the material 90 degrees. Measure it again. Turn it 90 degrees, measure it again, a couple of different places along that shaft, and I guarantee that you're going to see the difference in that pitch diameter to the material OD, because everything is relative to the OD. The pitch diameter is supposed to be from the center line of the material. If the material was running out, the pitch diameter is off-center, then theoretically the pitch diameter is greater, and the thread's not going to engage. One wire. Just use one wire and just check multiple places along the material, rotate the part accordingly. What else? Tool pressure. Tool pressure, material deflection. If you are spinning a tire, and the tire goes across the parking lot and hits a curb, what's going to happen? First thing it's going to do is going to jump up because that's the rotation. It's going to climb. As it comes down, it's going to go over the curb. It's going to keep on going. So two things are happening. There's up and there's out. Same things happen with tool pressure. Here's your material. Let's say the tool's upside down for now. Now let's go right side up, just make it easier to look at. Here's your tool. When this tool comes in contact with this part, two things are going to happen to this part. This part is going to see load in this direction and it's going to rotate this way. So when it moves off center, it's going to want to pivot right about here. It's going to want to climb over. So the two things that you would want to do with a steady rest in conventional setup is you would want your material supported here to avoid that rolling, and you're going to want it supported here. 90-90. Single point threaded a lot of extremely long 
small fine threads. If you watch my lathe series or my steam engine series, you saw me do it. And if you're making a steady rest of your own, or excuse me, a follow rest, <laughs> correct me on that. If you leave a comment with blasting me, I'm going to delete it. I've had a lot of success with 45 degree approach with a round feature that matches the stock. That has worked well for me in the past. So anyway, keep that in mind. The flexion needs to be supported in the two directions that it's going to bounce. If you invert the tool, you'll still need the one in the back, but you're going to want something on the bottom. Very important. Just visualize it in your mind. I will not be going out to the shop today because it's just currently not a good idea. And if you've read my community board, you know why. But that's all I got. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope that makes some kind of sense. I know that it's always good to understand what's going on and not just how to do it. Think outside the box or think inside the box or get a bigger box. <laughs> anyway, don't buy here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Stay well. Stay happy.